may be seated, please. Thank you very much. Again, what an honor to be here on the anniversary day to the day. Uh, this is a dream come true. January 20th uh, changed my life. And, um, you know, I, I was sharing last night, revival begins with the house of God. It always begins with the church to see. Uh, some of my friends here, it's just wonderful to see all these friends here. It's like a family reunion. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that uh, 1993 was the worst year of my life. Um, I, I was a depressed pastor. Um, basically, I resigned from the church I was senior pastor of in 92, living in Los Angeles, unemployed, the most expensive city in the world, with a family of six. I have four beautiful kids. They're all married now. They all love Jesus. Two of them are pastors. But back then, they were just teenagers that ate a lot, <laughs> and I had to feed them, and, uh, and unemployed, and we had to refinance our house just to make ends meet, and thank God we had a house that my parents helped me to buy in 1984 in California, but apart from that, we were struggling, and uh, I just felt like I need to be responsible for my family, so I was ready to quit the ministry. I was itinerating but not successfully, you know, and I was just speaking at small Chinese churches and Korean churches. And by the way, do we have any Koreans or Chinese here? And let me, let me go down a rabbit trail. I have to say this, most of you have never heard me speak, but we know how to tell the difference between Chinese and Korean. Can I just teach you a little cross-cultural lesson here? I know you think we all look alike, but we do look different. It's really, really simple. If you see a rich-looking Asian, they're Chinese. But if you see a handsome-looking Asian, he's Korean. So that's how you tell the difference. So I just want to make sure I go down on record <laughs> on the anniversary. But I was struggling. And, um, you know, I, I joked. I was so depressed, I had to exercise faith every day just to move from depression to discouragement. <laughs> I, I wasn't doing too well. Uh, but, uh, but God, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And, of course, he saved me in 73 in the midst of the Jesus People movement. But uh, I think the most painful thing was is that basically uh, we left a movement and, uh, and we were shunned by them. We were marked. It was just like Joseph and his brothers betraying you. You know, you give your life 19 years to a movement. In fact, it happened twice because then I became a vineyard pastor and John and I were, were let me just say this, we were, for me, it was the nicest maybe left foot of fellowship in the history of the church. <laughs> uh, they laid hands on Lou Angle and May and blessed us, and they said, we think you should continue the nightly meetings, but not as a vineyard. But I had this experience with another movement um, two years before, and I just wanted to resign because they didn't believe in women in leadership. Uh, they were getting away from the charismatic gifts. Uh, they were following people like R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur. I mean, we were birthed out of the whole charismatic renewal, and yet, uh, they were going backwards. It's like watching high-definition color and going back to black and white, and I just couldn't get it. And uh, so we resigned. Lou and I resigned. And the moment that happened, the persecution came. And, uh, and so I just, just said, this is unbelievable how the church can really hurt. But here's the point. When you love, the hurt is worse because the more you love, the more you can be hurt. And so we were a little bit disillusioned. I was going through a disillusionment. I was ready to quit the ministry, get a job, support my family. Uh, but then this outpouring took place. And uh, I'm just talking about one, the first night I came, Catch the Fire, October 1994. And uh, it wasn't even the conference hadn't started. It was Tuesday night. But they were having nightly meetings six nights a week, and I came, and um, I was so desperate, so hungry for God. And I remember John got up and said, if you want more of the Holy Spirit, come on up. I ran up to the front. I was in the front row. I was so desperate. And uh, I'm just standing there, and people are flying, laughing, shaking all over. And I said, this is going to be really good. And then some grandmother came up to me on the ministry team and prayed for me. And I, I don't know, I, I, I think I felt, but it was more of a courtesy fall. I didn't feel a thing. I didn't feel the laughter. I didn't feel the shaking. I'm just on the floor, and I said, I don't feel a thing. And the people around me are shaking all over. But God did such a deep work, because the first thing I saw when I was on the floor, I saw the face of my dad. My dad 
was the first Korean Southern Baptist pastor in North America. And he came uh, in 1958, but we had visa problems, so uh, we couldn't join him for almost three years. So my mother, sister, and I were stuck in Korea until 1960, and I was five years old when I immigrated here. And so I didn't know my dad. I was orphaned, uh, literally, uh, from the age of a little over uh, two to five. And, uh, and then, of course, when we united, my, my dad was gone because he was a pastor, but he was a marketplace leader and had to work uh, two jobs to support a family of four and soon to be five. But we had, they had their reunion uh, baby one year after we immigrated and my brother was born. And uh, he's six years younger than me and he loves the Lord. He's a member of our church. By the way, he went to Duke University. He's a medical doctor. He, he grew up here in North Carolina. And um, by the way, I have ties to North Carolina. My, my uncle was a professor at UNC. My brother went to Duke. And so uh, I have tremendous ties here. But anyway, but, but when I was on the floor, I saw my dad's face. And when I saw his face, um, I said, why are you showing me his face? And the Lord began to speak to me that you're still bitter towards your dad for the absenteeism because of the abuse. My dad was a prisoner of war in North Korea, and he was under the Japanese occupation. And he had been so traumatized during that period that he could not talk about it. I tried to ask him to give a little bit more of our, his history to know what he went through. And by the way, can we thank God for the US soldiers because my dad was born in Pyongyang. I mean that because here's what happened, the US this nation has saved our nation twice. First of all, you came and brought missionaries in 1880, evangelical missionaries to Korea. The British spent, sent their missionaries to China, but America sent their missionaries. And they were evangelical. When they heard about the Welsh Revival in 1904, they said, God, bring the Welsh Revival to Korea. And God answered their prayer, the Pyongyang Revival of 1907, which my great-grandmother got saved in that revival and began a lineage of, of pastors and leaders. And so I'm a pastor. My son's a pastor. My daughter's a pastor. My dad was a pastor. And uh, so I thank God for the missionaries who came. But in 1950, well, 45, when North and South Korea were divided, just like East Germany, West Germany, Truman had to settle with Stalin, and uh, just it, it was very arbitrary. And so if you're stuck in North Korea or East Germany, you're under communism, just overnight. And so, but Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of Kim Jong-un right now, wanted to unite all of Korea under communism. And so in 1950, he invaded South Korea, but the, before he did that, he arrested all the pastors. My dad was a Baptist single pastor, around 24 years old, he was arrested just to silence them. It's amazing. They know that pastors are to be the prophetic voice to a nation. And so in order to just silence them, they arrested all the pastors. Then they invaded South Korea. But immediately Truman knew they had violated the uh, agreement with Stalin. And so he sent General Douglas MacArthur, who was based in Japan, rebuilding Japan, over. And there was this brilliant... In China invasion, that it was just a brilliant stroke of military genius that split the North Korean army in half. He sent a division up to North Korea, another division down to Pusan. And when the North Koreans were pushed to the Chinese border, my dad was released from prison. And by the way, that's why I hate communism, because I, I have it in my DNA. Come on. And we got to be careful, because socialism is creeping into California. California is already a socialist state. It's government control, totalitarianism under the worst social, uh, woke, evil policies. And I'm not exaggerating. But anyway, so my dad got released and he came down to South Korea, went to Yongnok Presbyterian Church, met my mom, and had me and my sister a few years after the Korean War. So I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the U.S. soldiers. Can we have all the armed forces stand up right now? If you are a vet, I want you to stand up all over this place. We want to honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention. I know, I tell you, we have a lot of vets here in North Carolina. Well, Fort Bragg's here, so I'm not surprised, you know. And so uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your service for our nation. And so I'm here by the grace of God. I really mean that. 
But what happened was is that when he showed me my dad's face, I wept. I think I was on the floor for almost an hour just weeping. I was just undone. And um, ended up having a divine appointment with my dad when he came for my brother's wedding to Pasadena. I wanted to talk to him. I shared about it. And for the first time, I was 38 years old, the first time my dad said, I love you. Never heard that in my entire life. Part of it's a cultural thing. Part of it's his generation, but um, being Asian, Korean. But, but for him to say that, and then to say, I'm so proud of you that you're a pastor just like me, it just absolutely undid me. And truly, we're in the Malachi 4, 5, 6 period where he's turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of the children to the fathers. And, um, and I remember just, uh, he did it on the phone, but I was just weeping and laughing and weeping. I was schizophrenic. I was going through holy laughter, weeping, holy laughter, weeping. And it so healed my heart that I know I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Toronto. That was the genesis of my coming into a measure of wholeness, and we, we're never done. You know, we're one big onion. He just takes one layer at a time, you know. And I'm, I'm probably the biggest onion here. But anyway, it's like he just keeps on working at us. We're saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Amen. Come on. So, so I want to again thank you, John Carroll. It was the first night that changed my life, and it's, it's been an amazing ride. I made a covenant to just jump in the river. Ezekiel 47, the metaphor, the river flowing from the temple to the Dead Sea. By the way, there is no river. The Jordan River goes around Jerusalem. There's no river. It's a metaphor of the Holy Spirit. And didn't Duncan do a great job last night? And he preached from John 7. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and let him drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow what? Rivers of living water. And he was speaking about the Holy Spirit, which had not been given because he had not been glorified. And so, so this river, I want to encourage you, jump in and stay in the river. The river has carried us. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's been amazing 30 years. But I feel like we're just getting started. How many know the principle of revival is that we go from glory to glory? Second Corinthians 3.18, as we gaze upon him, we're being changed and transformed into his image from glory to glory. Now, some of you are going from glory to gory. You're going backwards, but God wants you to go into a higher level of glory. And, uh, and, and so that's his divine purpose. It's Romans 8.29. He is predestined. I believe in predestination, but it's not in the way you may think. He has predestined us to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And that's his purpose. And so it's all about Christ-like character. And uh, that's one thing I love about, uh, again, John Carroll, the Revival Alliance people. They're so humble. No, you know, we've been going on vacation together for 18 years now. I just counted. 18 years for one week. And uh, I'm talking about Bill Johnson, Heidi, uh, you know, John Carroll, Randy, Deanna Clark. We, we do this with George Banoff. It's based on a prophetic word from Bob Jones, who gave it to us in 2005. And he said, uh, form of revival alliance. And, uh, and I remember the first uh, retreat we had, I was hosting it in Pasadena, and Randy was on the computer looking to see if anyone, like Go Daddy Go, if anyone had revival alliance, and no one had it. So we bought up revivalalliance.org.net.com. It was just... And uh, it, it's amazing because John didn't really want to be part of another network. He said, man, I have catched the fire. I have so much on my plate. But when he heard that, remember, John, he said, we should form a denomination. We said, no, we're not going that direction. But, <laughs> but he is bringing his body together. John 17 is being answered that we would be one so that the world might believe that you sent your son. And that's the key. And so I just wanted to just open up by just saying that um, by the grace of God, I jumped in the river, and I have no, no exaggeration, no hyperbole. I've never been depressed since. It's just been the best joy ride. But see, but that's, that's for all of us. The kingdom of heaven is not meat or drink, but is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. Now, some of you look like you could use more joy. You look like you're wearing tight underwear. You don't look too happy this morning. Maybe, 
It was such a late night last night, and so, you know. By the way, you guys have late meetings. I, I, I went at, when the worship started at 11 o'clock, and, um, at, you know, and I got up, L.A., three hours difference, uh, at 4.17 this morning. And so if I, um, if I sound tired, just forgive me. Uh, it's just a little bit of jet lag. It's not a senior moment. It's just fatigue, okay? So <laughs> talking about a senior moment, my mother-in-law just went home to be with the Lord. She was 98 years old. Uh, she was a pediatrician, very successful doctor, and she's the first one in my wife's side of the family to give her heart to the Lord. Got baptized in the Holy Spoken Tongues. But this was back during the Jesus People days in the Charismatic Renewal. Um, and uh, she got saved in 1980. But, uh, but she was part of an amazing uh, retirement center because she was wealthy. Her husband was a medical doctor. They, they were in a very high-class uh, retirement center in San Diego. They had a doctor on call, nurse on call. They had a chef that was an amazing chef cooking for everyone in this retirement center. And once a month, they brought in a big band for them to have a dance because you just have these seniors who are widows and widowers, and they wanted them to mingle. <laughs> and so at this one dance, uh, this one widower was falling for this one widow, and he decided to propose to her that dance at that night after dinner. And uh, he proposed, and, but the next morning, he could not remember if she said yes or no. <laughs> he was having a senior moment. So he calls her, her, her room, from his room, and said, I had a wonderful time with you last night. And she said, I had a wonderful time with you last night. And he said, you know, I just have to just be honest with you. As I'm getting older, I'm forgetting things, and I know I proposed to you last night but I can't remember if you said yes or no. And she said, I said yes, and I met with all my heart. And I'm so glad you called me because I forgot who asked me to marry me last night. <laughs> well, we're all getting older, aren't we, John? We could tell these, these jokes as we're getting older, but I want you to turn with me to Haggai chapter 2. By the way, I want to highlight two books. They're all just donation only. It goes to our seminary, Wagner University, which I didn't start that seminary. Peter Wagner started that in 1998, but I inherited it in 2010. And uh, we're giving scholarships. Uh, we are in 72 nations, and some of these nations that can't afford a seminary, like one of our nations is Cuba, and we're uh, giving full, the same curricular. We have this school in seven languages now. And so we're uh, equipping pastors in Cuba for free. And so when you uh, buy any of my books, 100% goes to that cause. And that's the way I'm sowing into missions. But this book, The Reformer's Pledge, and the reason why I'm highlighting this, and I brought this because I feel this is what the Spirit of God is saying. In fact, James Gall, who's one of our prophets, had a dream two years ago where Jesus appeared in his dream, was holding this book, and he said, this is the book of the hour. And so John writes about the Father's heart. Lance Walno, the best Seven Mountain chapter anywhere he's written about. Uh, the transfer of wealth from uh, my mentor, Peter Wagner, Heidi, about going to the nations and the poor and stopping for the one. And so you have these amazing revivalists. Bill Johnson, of course, he, he writes about revival and glory, heaven invading earth. And so I want to give this to Ken. I don't know if you have this, Ken. Okay, well, th this is yours, Ken. My dear friend, Ken Goff from Sun Sunderland. And this uh, is my newest book. It came out in 2022, Turning Our Nation Back to God Through Historic Revival. Now, for those who don't know, I was a history major at University of Maryland, and when I went to Fuller Seminary, I focused on church history. And so I'm just a church history buff, and I, I don't know if there's someone who loves church history, revival history, uh, but if you do, raise your hand real quick. All right, so Duncan, this is for you then. Come on. I saw that hand. <laughs> All right. But I really do believe God wants to bring revival and reformation to our nation, and I feel Haggai chapter 2 is the passage I want to look at, and I believe this is a passage that he's speaking to us right now. Let's read from verse 7. I will shake all nations, then they will come to the desire of all nations. And that really is a poor translation. Uh, New American Standard, more accurate, says they will bring the wealth of the nations. And I will fill this 
temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place I shall give peace, shalom, says the Lord of hosts. And that's what the world is looking for. I want you to uh, look at one more passage, and then I just want to just share my heart. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews is basically quoting Haggai 2, and Haggai was written around 530 years before Jesus is born, all right? It's in the post-exilic period when they're trying to build the temple, finish the temple, uh, that the foundation was laid under Zerubbabel and Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, uh, out of his royal treasury, gave the funds for it, but then he dies, and Artaxerxes becomes king of Persia and stops. He receives an evil report from the Samaritans, and that's why the Jewish people had struggled with Samaritans and, um, and hated them, and they hated each other. And Samaritans were a mixed breed of Assyrians and Jewish people, and, um, and so their uh, religion was also kind of mixed. It would be like today, like Jehovah's Witness, uh, like a cult, you know, different doctrines, similar but different. And, but uh, Artaxerxes dies and Darius becomes king and he reads the decree made by Cyrus and he gives permission to resume after 18 years of a pause. They had just laid the foundation, now they're going to be building the temple that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. All right, so are you following me? So the writer of Hebrews is saying, chapter 12, verse 27, now this yet once more indicate the removal of things that are being shaken as things are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, how many know we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken? Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And please underscore that, reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Father, I just thank you so much for your word. We love your word. Lord, I just thank you for Duncan emphasizing the Bible last night, that everything has to be based on the word of God. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're this God who gives us the spirit of wisdom, of, of revelation and, and, and truth, and we pray for that right now. We pray for the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of you. And Lord, I want to echo what... Paul prayed in Philippians 3.10, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection, the fellowship of your suffering and being conformed to your death. Give us a revelation of what that means. Uh, bring us higher, Lord. I believe we're in the Revelation 4.1 where there's an open heaven and I heard the Lord say, come on up. And Lord, you're calling us all to go up to a whole different level of glory, of revelation, of transformation so that we can see revival, and transformation. In Jesus' mighty name, in Yeshua HaMashiach's name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now, I shared last night just briefly uh, three characteristics of a historic revival, and actually I, I really go into it in my book, Turning Our Nation Back to God Through Historic Revival. And as I've studied revival history, just very quickly, three characteristics, the church gets revived, then the harvest comes in, and then society is transformed. That is revival. So true revival includes reformation. But because the Lord is emphasizing reformation, we're almost saying revival and reformation, but in true historic revival, society has changed, and I mentioned Wilberforce being part of the Great Awakening of 1738, transforming all of England. Now, but what, what we have to emphasize, you have to understand, when they abolished slavery in all the British Commonwealth nation. It took almost 100 years from 1738 until 1833 before it happened. And unfortunately, we have just this instant mentality. It's Instagram. If you're from California, it's in and out burgers. You know, we want everything yesterday. It's microwave ovens. We expect revival and the fullness of it to happen in our time, in our generation. And I want to just submit to you that God comes in waves of revival and transformation. And we saw souls saved during the Toronto outpouring, but not the billion-soul harvest that Bob Jones prophesied. 
We haven't seen anything yet. And I want to submit to you that we're on the verge of seeing the billion soil harvest and the transformation of the nations. I really believe that's the next wave. It's happening around the world, of course, you know. Every day, 35,000 people are getting saved in China. Every day, 35,000 in India. And I shared last night, Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation, 35% of it is born again. And I, I was corrected, actually. Uh, Mel Tari was uh, in uh, our church when I quoted that, and he came up to me. He was from Indonesia, like a mighty wind author. And he said, with all due respect, uh, your estimation is low. It's not 35%, it's 45%. The largest Muslim nation, 45% born again. Can we thank Jesus for that? And so we're in a tremendous time of global harvest, but I am saying this harvest is for America and Europe. God is going to reap once again, and America will be saved. Can I hear an amen? Now, some of you, it's going right over your head, and you know, let, me give you some, let me give you some biblical basis for this, because um, I really believe uh, this, this prophecy from Haggai chapter 2, I'm going to shake all nations, is really prophesying to our time. The reason why I say that, because as a historian, in 2,530 years since this was written, only twice in history have we seen every nation shaken. It didn't happen during the Persian Empire. Of course, the Persians conquered the Babylonians and the Greek with Alexander the Great, and then the Romans came after that, but that's not nations fighting each other. It's one super nation taking over another nation. So the first time in history that the nations were being shaken globally all at once was World War II, 1939 to 1945. Believe it or not, every nation was involved in World War II. I mean, I know there were some nations like Vatican considered themselves a nation. They said they were neutral. Switzerland said they were neutral. Spain, Portugal said they were neutral. But they weren't really neutral. Spain and Portugal gave millions of dollars to Hitler. They were really aligned with the, uh, the Axis forces. And so you were either part of the Axis forces with Hitler in Germany, Mussolini, Italy, Harito in Japan, or you were the allied forces with the United States, Great Britain, and Soviet Union. Even though Churchill didn't, <laughs> he hated the Soviet Union, but he knew that they had to, for the purpose of overcoming Hitler, they had to unite together for a greater cause. It's just like the gang wars in L.A., the Bloods and the Crips. If you were not part of one or the other gang, you would get beat up, robbed, raped. And so you had to be protected, so you had to align yourself with one of the gangs. Well, on a global macro level, the same thing was happening in the world in World War II. So every nation was involved. It was a devastating war. Some estimate 100 million, but the conservative estimation is 80 million people died in World War II. Many of your relatives. How many of you ever saw the movie Saving Private Ryan? I encourage you to read, watch that because that's just, just one aspect of the war of uh, D-Day, Normandy, and, and just uh, the devastation of uh, how many lives were lost. But here's what's tragic about World War II. Eighty percent of the 80 million were civilian, just women and children were killed. And I, I, I believe Truman made the right decision, but just think about just dropping two atomic bombs just the lives lost. Just innocent people are not soldiers, they're not in the military. That's why what Hamas did was so evil. He didn't attack the military, he taught, attacked women and children, civilian, putting babies into an oven, laughing as they're burning to death while they're alive, raping the women. The autopsies show that they were raped because even though they were charred, there were still clothing on their top but nothing on the bottom. Men were beheaded, hanged. I mean, not just killing them, but in the most violent, evil way. And we thought this would never happen. In 70 years, it hasn't happened since the Holocaust, but it's just happened on our watch on October the 7th of 2023. And so we know that that was a huge shaking during World War II, 
I mean, think about the six million Jews. 80% of people who were killed were just innocent people. And so you see the shaking that took place, but here's the point I want to make. He promised, I'm going to shake all nations, but then I'll fill this house with glory. I emphasized his transfer of wealth last night, and by the way, thank you so much for those who gave. Can we thank God for the offering that we received for missions last night? And I'm, I prophesy to you, you're going to prosper. You're going to see a breakthrough. You watch what happens this, in the days ahead. You've got to expect it. And so, um, but he says, I'm going to fill this house with, with glory. See, the reason why God allows it to happen, I don't think God was behind the war. You know, I, I believe that Satan comes to still kill and destroy, but God is still sovereign. He causes all things to work together for good. C.S. Lewis said this way in The Problem of Pain. He whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. He shouts to us in our pain. In other words, when things are going well, who needs God? But when you're suffering, when you lost a loved one, you start turning to God and say, God, are you out there? Are you real? And so here's what happened. Right after World War II, the greatest revival broke out. And it began like clockwork, 1948, when Israel became a nation. They became a nation in 47, and they went through their own war in 48, but it's like clockwork. You have major revivals breaking out globally. You have the latter rain revival in Canada. How many of you know Canada has given us revivals several times? Come on. <laughs> Toronto, latter rain. In Saskatchewan, North Battleford, these Assembly of God pastors go on a retreat, and they get hit with the Holy Spirit. They begin to prophesy. Truth were restored, like singing in the Spirit, personal prophecy. I mean, we take that for granted today, but that was a norm in 1948. Apostles and prophets exist. And that's why, you know, to this day, the Assembly of God will say apostles and prophets are not for today because this was a renegade that left. And now, you know, the Assembly of God comes out with a position paper every, called the White Paper every year. And uh, they say apostles and prophets don't exist. I, I don't care about the title. How many know that there are more than 12 apostles? How many know the greatest apostle maybe was the apostle Paul? How many know that James, the brother of Jesus, who did not believe in Jesus, it says in John 7, his brothers didn't even believe in him, becomes a presiding apostle by Acts 15 over Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem? How many know that Barnabas was called an apostle? Look at Acts 14, verse 14. How many know there was a woman named Junia and Adronicus in Romans 16, 7 that was called an apostle? People say, I don't believe in apostles. Now, what do you do with a Heidi Baker who's planted thousands of churches, feeding thousands of people every day? I don't care about the title. We have one, Leanne Cinquenta, who was uh, part of our church. She went to Fuller Seminary. Uh, was, um, got her master's in cross-cultural study, and she came up to me, and she calls me Papa Che and said, Papa Che, I bought a one-way ticket to Varanasi. When she said that, the Lord spoke to me, this woman's radical. Basically, she's saying, I'm going to India to die there. I'm not coming back. And she said, would you send me out? I said, of course. And we sent her out. We're still supporting her to this day. She has planted 15,000 churches, thousands of pastors looking to her. And the way she does it is Heidi Baker. She, first of all, immersed herself in the Hindi language. She lived with a family that didn't speak any English, and she became fluent in Hindi. And initially, she went by walking from village to village and said, bring me the sick, bring me the blind, the deaf, and would pray for them. They would get healed, and then she would preach the gospel and establish a church. 15,000 churches. How's that for church growth and methodology of church planting? Come on. Sounds like the New Testament. So what do you do with women like that. Look, the Bible says when he ascended to heaven, he gave some to be apostles, Ephesians 4.11. Not everyone, but some are. Some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, teachers. Not everyone. But here's the thing that's so ridiculous. Do you know in America, only 1% of the church is in vocational full-time ministry? 99% are in the marketplace. 
It is ridiculous to think only the 1% of full-time pastors have received that mantle of being an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor. No, when he ascended, he gave it to the whole body. What's the scriptural basis for it? Well, it says in Acts 2, 17, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters, come on, ladies, will prophesy. There is such a woman's movement right now. I mean, all these Deborahs and Esther. And by the way, Deborah was a prophetess, and she was also a judge, a mother of Israel. I think she was an apostle slash prophet, to be honest with you. But what's happened is, is that with all the transgender nonsense going on, these mama bears are coming forth, and there's a movement called Don't Mess With My Kids. The reason why I was late for this conference was I was speaking at a conference with 2,700 women. I was doing a women's conference in Houston before I got here. I was surrounded by estrogen. I didn't know what to do about all this. I said, this is so much. Actually, I have three daughters and six granddaughters, so I have nine grandchildren, so all of them are girls, you know, so, so I'm used to it. But, but the point is, is that he's raising up all these Deborahs, these Esthers, Esther 4.14. That he's called you for such a time as this to save a nation. And so God is on the move. It's just so exciting. And, and so um, going back to what I wanted to get at is, is that the revival of 48, 49 was massive. The Hebrides revival of 49. Billy Graham from North Carolina in 1949 comes to Los Angeles and he's catapulted into international fame. And you know what? One of the highlights for me was meeting Billy Graham. He came to Pasadena in 2004, one, second to the last crusade he did. And I was on the executive committee. And so we hosted Billy Graham and, uh, at the Rose Bowl. And it was just historic. And most of the people who showed up, honestly, though, were believers who wanted to say thank you. All my life, he, Billy Graham's been my hero. So when I think of North Carolina, I don't think of Duke or North Carolina or the you know, the Triangle, you know, Research Center and technology and all that. I think of Billy Graham. And, uh, and, and so my whole life, I wanted to just shake his hand and say thank you for your integrity. Thank you for finishing well. Thank you for your example. But God does exceeding abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. I was invited to meet with him in his hotel suite with Jack Hayford, Lloyd Ogilvy, who ended up becoming our Senate chaplain, who is a Hollywood Presbyterian pastor. Ken Ulmer, the uh, African-American pastor of the largest church in Los Angeles. He bought the Great Western Forum. And I was the token Asian. And so I was there with, with uh, Billy Graham. And two hours just asking questions. I didn't ask one question. I was the youngest, and I just kept my mouth shut. I was just in awe just to be there. So two hours goes up, and... Everyone shared and talked, and we're ready to leave. And I could not believe none of them asked Billy Graham to lay hands on us for an impartation. Now, where did I learn impartation? From Toronto. So finally, I raised my hand, you know, like a little kid at school. And he looks at me. I didn't say a thing up two hours. And he said, okay, yes. I said, uh, Dr. Graham, would it be possible... Before we leave, if you could lay hands on us and impart to us your evangelistic gift. And this is typical of Billy Graham. He said, I will, but first I want you to lay hands on me. I want what you have. That's Billy Graham, so humble. And so here we are laying hands on Billy Graham, Lord Ogilvy, can, you know, we're, and then he laid hands on us. And as I'm walking out the door, Jack Haver said to me, how many know who Jack Haver is? He's like the gold standard of Pentecostalism, went home to be with the Lord in 2023, uh, 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 January the 8th. And he said to me, I've been with Billy Graham so many times, I've never had the guts to ask him to lay hands on me. I'm so glad you asked. Come on. God is so good. But Billy Graham was launched into, but here's the thing. Ten years later, the charismatic renewal began in 58. Dennis Bennett, Episcopalian Church. Uh, in Van Nuys, also in Southern California. Ten years after that, the Jesus People Movement, 67. Costa Mesa with Lonnie Frisbee, and I'm old enough, I knew Lonnie, and uh, Chuck Smith. And then the third wave with John Wimber hit ten years later, 
And I was a vineyard pastor. He was my mentor at Fuller Seminary, and Signs and Wonders and Church Growth, MC 510. And then 10 years after that, the Toronto outpouring. We're talking about 50 years of glory, but also Brownsville, come on, in Florida. So we're talking about from 48 to really 94 into going into the 2000, and we had 50 years of glory, unprecedented revival, wave after wave of revival. And now the second global shaking has happened in 2020. COVID-19 hit every nation. Just like World War II impacted every nation, we've just gone through the second shake, and I'm going to shake all nations. It's not just the COVID. I mean, people died of COVID for around 5 million, 6 million, but the numbers are so inflated, so it's nothing like World War II. But we're talking about the the lockdown, the mass mandate, the vaccine mandate, the economy just being ruined. One out of four restaurants in the United States went bankrupt. Just in California alone, 18,000 businesses went bankrupt. And it was so unnecessary. They could have kept open if they just mitigated. But no, it's all or nothing. The totalitarian control of the government. And so here's the... Here's the the Isaiah 520 moment in our nation, in our state of California, they said abortion clinics are essential. A strip club in San Diego is essential. Marijuana dispensary, because marijuana is legal in California, is essential, but the church is not essential. So at the peak of the pandemic, July 2020, by God's grace, he spoke to me to sue Governor Newsom. And it wasn't just me. It was our network of churches. I didn't even know how many churches we have. I, I lead a network of churches called Harvest International Ministry. We're in 72 nations. But we counted. We had 148 churches in California. Of course, we have the most in California because our, our uh, base is in Pasadena. Not knowing that it was our church, only, uh, we thought we were the only ones, but there was a United Pentecostal Church, Art Hodges, based in San Diego, his headquarters. But he also sued Governor Newsom with 450 churches and his network. Now, here's the point. As soon as I sued Governor Newsom, I get a letter from the city district attorney in Pasadena. She's a female woman, new, she doesn't know me, because uh, we're known in Pasadena because we have a performing arts center that we use for concerts, and we share the gospel every concert. And, uh, and they love us because... Uh, you know, we're opening up this building for performance arts, the classical music primarily. And, uh, but she wrote a letter and said, uh, this is not a threat. I'm just telling you, you will be arrested. Your jail term has been determined to be one year in prison. You will be fined millions of dollars as a church for opening up. This is in August now, one month after our uh, suit against Governor Newsom. And, and then we have the right to arrest any of your church members. And I'm thinking to myself, Newsom is allowing prisoners, rapists, criminals out of prison because of social distancing he wants in prison. It's too crowded in prison, so he's letting all these prisoners out. And yet they want to arrest law-abiding citizens or patriots who, who pay their taxes, the church of Jesus Christ. I said, this is madness. Is Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good, good, evil, darkness, light, light, darkness, bitter, sweet, sweet, bitter. I mean, think about it. Abortion clinics are essential, but not the church. Criminals being released is essential, it's important, but not the church. There's such an antichrist spirit against the church, and by the way, it's coming to you. It's not just California, as California goes. People are being arrested just praying quietly in England. It's amazing what's going on around the world. And so we're going through a global shaking. Here's the point I'm trying to say. With the shaking comes the glory. And God says the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. So if we have 50 years of glory and we're going from glory to glory, what is the next 50 years going to look like? 
Now, some of you are getting the revelation that we're on the verge of the greatest revival in the history of the church. I believe that the apostles in the New Testament long to see what we're going to be seeing. I really believe that from a historical perspective. But Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith? Are you in faith to believe God for a massive revival and reformation? See, Bob Jones prophesied one billion souls are going to get saved in this revival, and he said, what's going to happen after I die? And he died February 14th, 2014. You know, he died on Valentine's Day, 2014. And I remember Bob, because Bob preached at our church. I preached with him at conferences, and he's the one who prophesied for revival lines to come together. He told Heidi and Roland Baker that, and they told us, and we came together in 2005, 2006. But Bob Jones, in 1983, said these things will happen before the billion soul harvest. He said abortion pill will be invented. We thought he was nuts, abortion pill. But the morning after pill came into existence. The second thing he said is same-sex marriage will be legal in America. Everyone called him a false prophet. But 2014, it became legal. So he said, after these things happen. And he also had a fun one. He said, the Kansas City Chief will win the Super Bowl. (laughs) They won last year. They won twice since that prophecy. But I think one was during the pandemic, 2020, but nothing happened. But I think after 2023, last year, they won the Super Bowl. Believe in the prophets. And one of the weirdest ones is that there will be a watch invented that the Chinese will be listening to worship music while they work in the rice paddies of China. And of course, that's now doable with the Apple Watch. You just turn it on to your worship music with your phone, sync it, and you're listening to worship music on your... And, you know, and why, why China? Because you talked about 300 million. We are seeing more people saved radically in China than there are now in America, way more. 2014, I had the privilege with Peter Wagner. He convened five major apostles of the largest house church movement in all of China. They never even met each other. But we convened at Hanan Island. And uh, for example, one, I can't even give you the name for security reason, but one apostle in a city of 10 million saw 5 million get saved. Five million, half. We're, that's the kind of level of revival. He has planted churches in every city of 10 million or more. And what's stunning is that he's establishing businesses because with a Chinese communist passport, he could go into the Muslim nations. They want these Chinese businessmen to establish businesses, but they don't realize it's an underground church in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, <laughs> Pakistan. And I believe the largest missionary movement is coming from China and Brazil and some of the other hot spots around the world. By the way, U.S. is still the number one mission sending, mission giving church. Can we thank God for the United States on our, our redemptive gift? But why am I saying that I, we're in a time of not only a, a billion soul harvest, but reformation, transformation? I, and, and again, I want to just build my fence here because of the whole dualism of separation of church and state, which is not biblical. Jesus is king and Lord over all, including every mountain, the church mountain, the business mountain, government mountain, family mountain. But what Trump did by nominating three Supreme Court justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, if it wasn't for them, I would be in jail right now. The point is elections have consequences. But let me take it one step further. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus and his kingdom. We give him all the glory that we won in the Supreme Court 6-3. I'll be in jail otherwise. But on June 24, 2022, the Dobbs decision reversing Roe v. Wade happened in this watch of ours in this revival. It is monumental. To me, remember that date. It's like October 31st, 1517, when Luther nailed the 95 Theses on Wittenberg door. It's historic. It's the beginning of the Reformation we're longing for. 
We haven't seen anything yet. And just like it took time before slavery got abolished. Remember, the Slave Trade Act was 1807, was 1833 before uh, the emancipation of all slaves in the British Commonwealth nations took place. It takes time. But I really believe that he is serious about us discipling nations. He didn't just say win souls and disciple them in nations, and that's, of course, a foundational part of it. But he said, I really want to save nations. I love what it says in Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. It didn't say those who were lost. What was lost in the garden? The family was lost. The first institution was a family. He created the male and females that be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Why fill the earth? Because Eden represented heaven on earth, and he wanted the whole earth to be full of his glory. And that hasn't changed. Numbers 14, 20 says, as surely as I live, which is hyperbole for God, he's eternal. Of course he's going to live forever. He never had a beginning. But he says, as surely as I live, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, at the second coming of Jesus, when he creates a new heaven, new earth, that's when it will happen. No. Habakkuk 2, 14 says, the knowledge of the glory of God, the knowledge will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And the exegetical key there. It's the waters cover the sea because when Jesus comes back, Revelation 21, 1, he creates a new heaven and new earth, and there's no more sea. So in other words, when the knowledge of the glory of God is going to cover the earth as a water, it's going to happen on this watch before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Why should we believe God for all the good things to happen when he comes back? It takes faith to believe God now. And yet we just result in just, you know, fatalism, just say, well, when he comes, then he'll create a new heaven, new earth. No, God always wanted heaven on earth. But what does that look like? Now, we talk about, you know, Bill, of course, wrote the bestseller, Heaven Invades Earth, and brilliant book. And I've read that three times. I just love it. Bill's my mentor. He's my apostle, to be honest with you. Uh, he's been a pastor to me ever since Peter Wagner passed away in 2016. But, but here's the thing that... Uh, we emphasize, yes, there should be no more, no more sickness, and we should believe God because there's no sickness in heaven. And by the way, we saw three people with stage four cancer healed in our local church last year. Total cancer-free. So I'm all in. We're, I've been in the healing ministry since 74. We're believing God for greater glory in the supernatural. And obviously, there's no one demonized in heaven. But here's what Jesus says. The Word of God says is what heaven looks like. Psalm 89, verse 14, and you see this everywhere in Scripture, the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. Love and truth proceed. Has said, loving kindness. And so we're to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And what does that mean? Righteousness and justice. The kingdom of heaven is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. By the way, peace is not the absence of conflict or lack of tribulation. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation in, in John 16. In fact, I, I, I remember this illustration I heard uh, from a Presbyterian preacher, and uh, he was talking about uh, there was a real contest. A foundation was given to artists who could draw peace, to paint peace. And uh, one person uh, painted this beautiful sunny day, uh, the flowers were blooming, the sky was blue, the clouds were just billowing just all around, and this little girl was running through the fields. And that was his depiction of peace. Another person painted this placid lake, it was just absolutely still, someone sailing on the lake, and beautiful day, and the wind's just blowing, and just that serene look. He said, this is peace. But do you know who won? The person who won was, was a picture of a major rainstorm, lightning flashing the sky dark uh, on a cliff where the waves were crashing against the cliff. And on the shelf of the cliff was the eagle's nest. And there was a mother eagle with her eaglets under her, protecting her from the storm, and that person won the $100,000 price. 
And that is a picture of what God is asking us to do. He says, my peace I give to you is not a physical peace. In this world, you're going to have trials and tribulations. In fact, he's using the shaking to discipline us. I believe that we're going through a divine discipline. By the way, it's a sign of love. It's Proverbs 3, 12, who, who, 12, whom the Father loves, he disciplines. So we could share in his holiness and righteousness, it says in Hebrews 12. So if you're going through a hard time, listen, in everything give thanks. Not for everything, but in everything. For this is God's will concerning you. And so I, I prophesied to our church, we're going to continue to go through a shaking. It's not over. It's not like we're going to have a breakthrough from the shaking. What I read in the Bible is that we're going to see parallel streams in the last days. It's Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth. Deep darkness. We're going to see light and darkness parallel. We're going to have shaking, but also glory. And so just accept that, because that's just part of life. Life is hard. In this world, John 16, 33, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so we win. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and we will reign forever and ever. Amen. Revelation eleven fifteen. right? But what do we have to do to prepare for this revival and reformation? He says we're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us receive grace and serve God reverently and in fear and trembling. Hebrews chapter 12, 28. I believe what God is restoring is the fear of the Lord in the church. We had 30 years of the Father loves you, which I got wrecked on that because I really had God's, my earthly father turn his heart towards me and say, I love you. That never happened prior to that time. I was 38 years old. But I believe we're in an Isaiah 11, 2 moment that the Spirit of the Lord, it's the Spirit of the Lord, it's a, it's a messianic prophecy about Jesus. It's going to be upon Jesus, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and power or might. How many of you want more power? Well, there was so much power in the early church because there was a fear of the Lord in the early church. You read about that. Just read Acts 6, uh, Acts 5 with Ananias or Sapphira. But in the early days, there was just great reverence. And then God was doing mighty signs and wonders through the apostles. But here's the thing. It says that it's the spirit of wisdom and understanding, knowledge, and power. And it says, and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear. It's a gift through the Holy Spirit. It's what he prophesies in Jeremiah 29, that I'm going to make a covenant with you. And I'm going to put my heart. And I will put my fear in you in perpetuity forever. It's an amazing verse. Why is that so crucial? Because in order to transform society, we need power. But I believe the key to power is the fear of the Lord. We need wisdom. I believe the key to wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In fact, the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9, 8. By wisdom, a house is built. Paul, as an apostle, was a wise master builder because he walked in the fear and reverence of the Lord. So what is the fear of the Lord? Fear of the Lord is to hate what he hates and love what he loves. The fear of the Lord, and I, I really believe that because uh, right after Queen Elizabeth went home to be with the Lord, and she was a believer, on September the 8th, 2022, I may mean, remember that. It seems like years ago, but it was just a few years ago. The longest living monarch, 70 years she goes home to be a Lord. I'm in Austin, Texas, speaking at one of our HIM churches, and I um, asked um, uh, the, the pastor there, I said, uh, because she's prophetic, and uh, I said, uh, what, what do you, she had just died, Queen Elizabeth. I said, do you feel that there's any prophetic sense of what's going on? Because, by the way, uh, everyone died on the 8th. 8 is a day of new beginnings. Why, why am I saying that? Because if you just look at Google, Jack Hayford died on January the 8th. Pat Robertson died on June the 8th. Lauren Cunningham died on the 8th. And, and Queen Elizabeth died on the 8th. And I just say, is that a coincidence? 
It could be. Look, I'm not that prophetic. I mean, some people are so prophetic that I don't think God understands them. But, but I, 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 but you know, but this was shouting at me that the number eight. And so I asked Richard and Sylvia and, and Austin, I said, what do you make of this? And she said, I was asking the Lord the same thing, and the Lord told me, Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temples. The fear of God hid Isaiah. Now, he had been a prophet already, and he's the one who prophesied just the chapter before, Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good, good evil. But he said, woe to me, I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. See, when the fear of the Lord hits you, Jeremiah says it this way, and Jeremiah, I believe, is uh, 17.9. It says, the heart is so deceptive above everything else. Desperately sick. Who could understand it? We don't even see our sins. But when the fear of the Lord comes, all of a sudden, I'm a man undone. I see my pride. I see my selfishness. I see the evil in my heart. And God says, I want you to hate what I hate, because here's what he says. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, it enumerates what this evil is. Pride, arrogance, and a perverted mouth I hate. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. I'm so shocked at how many Christians cuss. It's ridiculous. They're dropping F-bombs in their fight against their spouse. I know because I have to counsel them, and I'm shocked what the kind of language they use. The Bible says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but such a word that's good for edification. And so we, we see that there's deception in our lives, and we've got to hate what he hates. By the way, that word is a strong word, hate. I remember when our kids were, we had four kids, we homeschooled, and and uh, when they would say, I hate broccoli, we said, don't use that word. Just say, dislike it. That's such a strong word, you know. But then God rebuked me and said, I, I use the word hate. And not only that, I use the word abomination. Proverbs 6, 16, there's six things the Lord hates, seven, which is an abomination. Again, pride is number one. Number two is a lying tongue. There's so much lies going on. I mean, it's not just fake news in the media. It is fake news from the pulpit. We're complicit when we don't preach the whole counsel of God. If you don't call abortion sin or homosexuality a sin, you're lying to your people. We're so seeker sensitive, we don't want to lose tithers. The root issue is the love of money. We don't have a secret sense of church, as you could tell. <laughs> you know. Every year of election, I give who I'm voting for. In 2016, I gave five reasons why I'm voting for Trump. I did that in 2020. I had people walk out on me. Stand up in Southern California. We're talking about the left coast. <laughs> By the way, they're all women. I think they were voting for Hillary. So they all just, I'm not sure, but they walked out on me. When I sued Governor Newsom, one of my pastors resigned on me and said, uh, Papa Che, I disagree with the direction you're going on. If we got to mitigate, we got to protect our people. I said, what about the Word of God? How many know Newsom's not the head of the church? Jesus is. He said, do not forsake the assembling of the saints, which is a habit of some, especially as you see the day drawing near in Hebrews 11, 25. And I said, no, i got to obey Jesus. And he told me very clearly to uh, take a stand. By the way, it's time for us to rise and shine, for the light has come. Let's all stand up.